Hey everybody, it's Allie, and welcome to our YNR chat for Sunday, March 30th, 2014. I'm coming at you today with an all audio YNR chat, and I have a really good excuse for not doing a video portion this week. My car broke down, the engine essentially exploded, and I had to go get a new car. And let me tell you, it has been days of haggling over getting a new vehicle. It is not easy. I had to go to the dealership and haggle for my life. I know that you guys probably all think I'm over here living in the YNR lush estate. State, <laughs> but I don't have that much money, so I got to fight for every penny that I've got. And I knew I could not continue to pour money into an old car, so I went out and I struck myself one heck of a deal on a brand new car. <laughs> I am feeling so good about how I negotiated too. Victor Newman would be proud. I mean, believe me, I put on my Victor Newman mustache and I went to town on these people. I had to be no more Mrs. Nice Alley, and I had to be the negotiator instead. I mean, I, I did. I, I thought about YNR, honestly, while I'm trying to close these deals. Like, it's what would Victor Newman do? <laughs> Nobody offers Victor Newman a bad deal. <laughs> And they didn't for me either. I got a nice, brand new, super smelling good car. I love it so much. I've had like f probably four or five hours of sleep over the course of the last two days. I mean, no joke. It was, it was, it's just not been pretty. But I am, I've been successful. I was able to watch all my YNRs and I just wanted to at least pop on and talk about the main storylines while I have a chance. I mean, for crying out loud, while Devon is out buying luxury vehicles, <laughs> I'm fighting <laughs> for a reasonable Ford Focus. <laughs> My goodness, I wish I had a Devon Hamilton in my life that would just come on right up and say, Oh, Allie, you need a new car? How about Hazel to match your eyes? <laughs> and I would say, Thank you very much. I will accept. <laughs> oh, boy. So, GC Buzz has broken a new story about Devon. He bought Esmeralda, yes, a car to match her eye color. These two are painting the town. You know, I want to see some more of it. You know, we're all hearing about it secondhand, but I want to see Devon out there wheeling and dealing and throwing down his dough. Not because I think it's cool, because I, I, I do think that Catherine gave him his money to work, do good in the world. I think Catherine would want him to do good in the world and not just buy some model a car, flashy cars. Although I think she would have accepted that. What, what I, The reason why I would want to see Devon Whelan and Dylan is because I think it's part of his process. I think the audience needs to see and understand this transformation that's happened in Devon. He's gone from homeless orphan kid to mega billionaire. And I think we need to understand that transformation in order to empathize with the transition he'll probably go through on the, you know, in the next couple months or years or I don't know, where he comes maybe back out on the other end and decides to focus more on philanthropical ventures. But it's like, for right now, we get that sense that he's a poor, lost, rich kid. And I kind of want to see him go through the process. Um, he did reveal later in the week that he did this whole thing. Like, he leaked this story, I guess, about the car and his extravagant spending to GC Buzz to drum up publicity for the fashion show, which is a good idea. I mean, I can see where that's coming from. It was a nice little twist. I was glad to see that he wasn't totally being led around on a leash by Esmeralda. But I tell you, I think that Devon knows exactly what Esmeralda is all about. I have not been like the world's biggest Devon fan, but I would like to think that he's at least no dummy, that he at least recognizes this and takes from the Mason situation that people are going to want to be around him for his money and they're going to want to take advantage of him for his money. He has got to be able to sense that this girl has a motive, and she does, and it's making Hillary totally jealous, by the way, because it's 
seemed like something was going on with them. And now all of a sudden, he's all about Esmeralda in the press. Snap, snap, snap. Fancy cars. And Hillary who tried to save him from Mason after introducing him into their lives, of course, but tried to save uh, Devon from people taking advantage of him. She really didn't get a whole lot of, like, reward from him. Didn't really, you know, they started a friendship and it didn't go any further. So I think she is very jealous about what's going on with Devon and what his choices are right now. But she's got big plans of her own. So as the week opened up, Neil and Hillary are getting ready to go on a business trip together to L.A. Neil comes down the stairs of the athletic club uh, and he's basically on his way out the door when Leslie bumps into him and notices that on the floor next to him is a set of women's luggage (laughs) there at the foot of the stairs. And she assumes that he's running off with a beautiful woman. And he is. (laughs) It's not exactly as it appears, but he is. And so I I think she's jealous about that. I mean, he and Hillary are becoming very buddy-buddy. Leslie's off going on dating sites trying to move on with her life. And Neil seems to be unwittingly moving on with his life with Hillary. I mean, my goodness. They're having dinner or having lunch. They're in L.A. seeing the sights, enjoying them themselves. They're betting on March Madness and just having a really good rapport. Hillary gets it in her mind that since she's in LA, when in Rome, go to the Price is Right. <laughs> so we have this crossover into the Price is Right. Ugh. She and Hillary and Neil go on to the show. And of course, Hillary gets picked to play the games. <laughs> you know, they go through the whole process. It was the cheesiest thing that I have seen on YNR all year. And I loved it. <laughs> I know it's crazy because you would think I would be like, oh, please. But, yeah, I haven't seen The Price is Right in a while. But but it is the show that airs before YNR. So if you watch YNR, you've probably caught little glimpses of Price is Right throughout the years. If not recently with Drew Carey as the host, then certainly you have seen the Bob Barker Price is Right. And I bet it's been a while. So for me, it was really more about nostalgia. <laughs> it wasn't like some big, huge power movement for YNR. But it it wasn't. I thought it was cute. I know a couple. I got mixed reactions this week from different people saying, oh, that was stupid. And then other people are like, I loved it. So, I mean, I know it's it's all over the place. I just thought it was a little bit fresh. It was nice to see something different. Hillary goes to play Plinko. The game she gets to get picked for was Plinko, which is the best game. (laughs) That's the game I would want to play. So I was a little jealous. (laughs) And she, she ended up winning like I don't know, $12,000 or something like that. So it was a good for her, and it was cute to see Hillary. I, I have not felt very warm toward her, and at different points throughout this little v- adventure, I did, I did. I thought, she, you know, she, I warmed up to her a little bit. Now, on the way back to Genoa City, after all the hubbub, I mean, I think they were there to meet with Forrester. There's going to be a crossover for this fashion show, which I hope that there is going to be actual crossover and an actual fashion show. I'm looking forward to that. But on Hillary and Neil's way back home, their flight was delayed, which, you know, is like the equivalent of getting caught in an elevator together. They have to stay in a hotel room together. I mean, what, was there only one hotel room? Because there was, like, two double beds. <laughs> I mean, the implication is they were staying in the same room, right? You guys get that? I did. I, there's They couldn't have got two rooms? They're on a tight budget over there at Jabot? I don't know. They're sitting back at the hotel room, and she brings him, like, a real crap. I think they were in Oklahoma, or I don't know. Some It was some little hotel in some little town. I got the impression and she brings him not so great, I guess, room service and snacks and drinks. And they're just sitting there together on the bed watching March Madness and being real buddy buddy. And Hillary even mentioned something to him like that she can't believe Leslie would have left him when he's such a nice guy. And um, I mean, I are you guys, is this what is it gonna be Neil? And Hillary hooking up, is Neil seriously going to be ended up with a girl that is young enough to be his daughter, who his 
actual daughter, well, kind of actual, not biological, but who his actual daughter actually hates? I cannot believe what an amazing addition to the cast Colin is becoming for me. I really didn't expect it. I did not feel passionate about Colin the first time he was on the show. And I am loving him this time. He has, <laughs> quote unquote, saved Kane's life at this point. So Lily and Kane are not quite as hostile toward him as they were in the past. And so he's able to actually <clears throat> come onto the show as sort of a decent, maybe okay guy, and it, he, he is developing kind of a relationship with his son that we haven't seen before, and I kind of like it. I, I like it, and I want to see more of Kane and Colin together and their relationship. I wonder if Colin is ever going to be discovered for having been involved in that jewel heist. I don't know, but Colin is kind of looking out for Kane's best interest, which I can appreciate. It'll probably be the first time. Kane, he's being drawn in to Victor's world, and Colin is convinced that Victor could be setting up Kane to take the fall for this whole Bonaventure mess in the first place and in the future, and I don't know that I totally disagree with Colin. Uh, it's certainly possible. Colin actually confronts Victor at the athletic club. Victor's sitting there, probably having his morning coffee and looking at some business papers, and Colin just marches right up to him and says so. I don't, I think you're setting up my son and I don't like it. I tell you, that was much enjoyed by me. Much, much, much. I, I mean, it's like the boisterous, egotistical Colin versus the cool, collected, but like seething under the surface Victor. Newman, it got a little heated. Kane had to break it up, but I tell you, I like Victor having new foes. The, the Victor versus Jack thing can get a little old after a while, so I am kind of enjoying them going head to head. And again, I tell you, it just would not surprise me. I wouldn't put it past Victor if he did end up and is intending to end up setting up Kane to take the fall for this whole thing. Chloe and Chelsea still have to work together. They own a business together. And this week they had a meeting with Lauren and Lily to talk about the fashion show. And it's tense in the room. I, I tell ya, Chloe is really surprising me right now. She made some remark about, I mean, they're in the middle of a business meeting. And Chloe made some remark about, well, I still work here. Do you want to get a, a restraining order against me for that too? I'm surprised at Chloe's audacity. I'm surprised at how bold she is being. The whole time <laughs> these four women are in the room trying to get some work done, Chloe is throwing shade through the whole meeting. Oh, oh, are you sure you trust me to make that decision, Chelsea? I, I am surprised. I got a, a voicemail from Silvana this week who mentioned the same thing. It is surprising that Chloe has no shame or that she's converting her shame into an outward rage, uh, considering what she did. And the more important part that Silvana made that I thought, you know, Ch Chelsea is trying to be too nice to her. She, this is, was her best friend. And Chelsea feels bad for everything uh, Chloe has gone through and probably guilty for what Adam did, supposedly, to Delia. But Chelsea is letting her get away with it a little bit too much. I, I, I don't understand. How can Chloe sit there and be so smug with Chelsea when she tried to steal her baby? Billy and Chelsea were all warm and fuzzy last week, but now he is none too happy about her notion that Adam is still alive. He doesn't want to hear it. She believes against all odds that her husband is still alive out there somewhere and calling her anonymously, and Billy doesn't want to have to accept that at all. That is an uncomfortable reality for him if by any chance Adam is still out there. And Billy was with her when she received one of these hang-up phone calls, and it really rattled him. Now, <laughs> this homeless dude 
who saw the whole crash, the only witness to this whole thing who insists Adam is still alive, goes to Paul on his own and he wants to talk and tell his whole story. Now, you know who might have been really helpful in this situation? Alex. (laughs) Alex would have been helpful. He could have gone in and really sexified the situation and pulled the information out of the homeless dude. (laughs) Can somebody tell me where he is? There's nothing wrong with the cop that's, you know, that's helping Paul out and assisting him now. I don't know what his name is. I need to figure that out. But there's nothing wrong with him. But he is not... Mr. Spicy Latin Hottie Man. I, I I tell you, I go in and I check YNR news sites and I have not seen a single thing about where that actor is. And YNR has not addressed it this time. So is he, has he been replaced? Is he coming back? Can somebody please tell me when my spicy Italian sausage will be here? <laughs> oh, I'm hungry. <laughs> Okay, 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 okay. Sorry. (laughs) Oh, boy. So, Paul and this other cop are interrogating this homeless guy, and he... He's out of it. I think he's partially out of it and partially right on. He seems to have some, some right information, but... Not entirely. So, uh, I, I I don't know. I don't know how much to believe of this homeless guy's story. I don't think Paul really buys it. I think the most obvious answer to all of this is that Adam is dead. And I think that's also uh, the most convenient for everybody, except for Chelsea. Adam made, you know, a, a, an easy target to pin all of the whole Delia thing on, and then he just got brushed off of the scene. Billy... I was surprised by this. Billy goes to Paul and he starts to question him about Adam. Could he, you know, what what do you know about this? What's the situation? I thought it was very bold of Billy. And it reminded me that Billy never did get charged with everything that happened with Adam. I mean, he did take him at gunpoint around and he did essentially hold him hostage. So why did Billy never get punished for that? It seemed like YNR was going in that direction. Do you remember that scene where Billy's lying on the couch and Paul's questioning him and Billy was keeping the secret the, the the gun went off. Billy has told the truth about everything that happened that night except the fact that the gun went off in the car prior to the crash. And I think that Billy believes that he killed Adam by gunshot before the crash even happened. Victoria is back in town with Reed. And as soon as they get back into town, they go to the coffee house and they run into Stitch. Stitch is there before, I mean, they see Stitch before they even see Billy. And it's almost being set up as this competition between Stitch and Billy. Who's the better man? I guess morally and also maybe for Victoria. Who's the better man? Now, all I can tell you is one guy had a cinnamon roll (laughs) and the other guy didn't. That's all I'm saying. (laughs) Stitch is there with the very last cinnamon roll at the coffee house and Reed specifically wants a cinnamon roll. So he hands over that cinnamon roll to that kid and it's supposed to be this, aw, Stitch is such a good guy moment, which I think is going to turn on a dime at any moment here. Uh, I I think Stitch leaves and Billy shows up and, you know... Just speaking on the whole Stitch versus Billy thing, I I don't dislike Billy. I don't think Stitch is better than him, but I do have issues with Billy that have just never gone away. I got an, a voicemail from Gary this week who had asked, you know, remind me what it was that Billy did that is, you know, has caused so much problems. And I can only speak for myself, but I... I never have entirely forgiven Billy for the fact that he was not there for Delia during the uh, whole leukemia thing. And I mean, I don't know why it sticks with me for that. I feel like Billy totally kowtowed to Victor. He allowed Victor to manipulate him emotionally and physically, keeping him away from his daughter. But I mean, they're got, I guess, uh, Bill, it was when he was in Myanmar. I think Billy had gotten himself into trouble and the, Victor found him and maybe let him sit in 
in a jail for a couple of weeks, but eventually uh, they came back into Genoa City and Victor was sort of just emotionally manipulating Billy. Billy was in town knowing that his daughter had cancer and yeah, maybe he showed up uh, here and there just like to see her in the night when no one else was there, but I mean, for the most part, he stayed away and he allowed Victor to keep him away from his daughter when she needed him most, and that bothered me. And furthermore, when he was in Myanmar is when he got Chelsea pregnant. Now, I know that there was some level of Chelsea's manipulation there, but at the same time, from a relationship standpoint, if my husband goes off, I felt, first of all, I feel like Billy kind of abandoned their relationship. He abandoned Victoria for a while. He, They were having trouble in their relationship. Probably Victor was up in it. And Billy just left, and he goes to Myanmar, and he gets drunk. He puts himself into another bad situation that he tends to do by being irresponsible. And he hooked up with Chelsea and got ended up getting her pregnant. And whether it was her manipulation or not, my husband gets another woman pregnant, we're done. I don't care what the situation is. I don't care how much I love him. We're done. So I do think that Billy is not blameless here. I don't want to make it sound like he's some monster, and I know that there's arguments on a million different sides of all of that, but that, for me, has been the sticking point with Billy. Uh, He is redeemable. He is a lovable guy, and he's been through some bad stuff recently, so I don't hate him at all, uh, but I can understand where Victoria wouldn't want to um, to deal with him anymore. Now, Reed loves Billy, and he wants to just, like, connect with him. He's back in town. He probably worries about his mother being all alone and wants her to feel safe with her husband, and so uh, Reed really is <laughs> driving home that he wants to spend some time with Billy, even though Victoria has kicked him out of the house. Victoria has to end up agreeing to allow Billy back into the house so that he can play video games with Reed, which, I mean, Reed unknowingly kind of helps Billy get his foot back in the door, only to get it smacked away when Victoria serves him with legal separation papers. I was surprised. Avery had talked Victoria out of that, I thought, and then she goes to Washington, D.C., I guess meets up with a lawyer and has the papers drawn up. Billy was shocked. I was shocked. I, I don't understand the benefit of the legal separation, and it's maybe just ignorance on my part, but why not either, why do you need to make it formal? Either get divorced or don't. I don't understand what the legal separation part does, other than maybe if it's a negotiation tool, a bargaining tool. I don't, I don't know. Maybe you guys can tell me. What's the benefit of the legal separation? I don't know. Billy is just heartbroken. He signs his half of the papers, walks out the door, and of course, (laughs) right into the park where Kelly is there. She just got her ass chewed by Abby, so she's crying, feeling horrible about herself. Billy is now recently uh, uh, legally separated from his wife, realizing that she's taking steps toward ending this. The separation is now not getting them closer, it's getting them further apart, so here Billy and Kelly are in the park, meeting again. What a coincidence. He tells her everything about what happened with Victoria, and she's so upset. He pumps her up, makes her feel better, and he ends up handing her this handkerchief from his pocket, and she takes it, and she's really, she's taken aback by the fact that he's handed her a a, a handkerchief, because it's such a gentlemanly, old world sort of thing to do, and I really appreciated that. I zeroed in on that moment right away, because I just think it is one of those nice things, nice gentlemanly things, like opening a door. I mean, men don't carry handkerchiefs anymore. So when he did that, I I liked that moment between them. And, oh, good Lord, as they're sitting there on the park bench comforting one another, of course, Victoria is lurking in the background. I don't know why she, what she was doing there. Doesn't she have Reed to take care of? Why was she even in the park? <laughs> but here she is witnessing another intimate moment between her husband and this other woman. So she's wrecked over this, of course. She thinks, you know, you know, I may have gone to the trouble of getting this legal separation, but he is going right into another woman's arms. So she... she 
runs off to the bar. Now, just recently, um, Stitch has found out about his almost ex-wife uh, planning to take his kid out of the country after their divorce, which is happening now, I suppose, like they're just now getting the divorce finalized. So he's at the bar, too. Victoria and Stitch are sitting there throwing back drinks, and she actually signs her legal separation papers right there at the bar. She whips them out, signs the papers at the bar with Stitch's pen. <laughs> with a, She signed her own legal separation papers with another man's pen. <laughs> I don't know why, but that sounds so dirty. <laughs> oh, man. Now, at the same time, Jack is really missing Phyllis. He had a nice kind of scene with Avery this week where they sit down and they're trying to talk about what to do about Phyllis. It was weird. It was um, kind of a cliffhanger. Avery says, we need to decide what to do about Phyllis. And I thought, oh my gosh, are they going to pull the plug on her? No, they're not going to do that. But no, (laughs) Avery just wanted to discuss with Jack what to do with like her taxes. What do you do? Who even considers that? What to do with a taxes for the for a person who's in a coma (laughs) Avery apparently uh so that was a little bit of a false uh I don't know false flag I guess uh but it did allow them to have a nice conversation and Avery I don't know it, it allowed Jack to open up a little bit she said you know it's not just that you're thinking about Phyllis every day you're thinking about Phyllis every moment and I think that is very true and I think he's He's feeling guilty about what he did to Kelly, offering her that money to go away. He does not want to be Victor. I think him doing that kind of bribey thing was a very Victor move, and Billy pointed that out. And Jack, the difference, I guess, between Jack and Victor is that Jack doesn't want to be that. So he's feeling guilty about what he did with her, and he's, you know, she's working at the athletic club, so he goes upstairs to try to talk to her again. He walks into her office, waving that white flag handkerchief, and she starts, you know, she says, what is it with you Abbott men and these white flags or these white handkerchiefs? And Jack says, um, oh, you know, he starts to say it was something our father always taught us. And just again, another sweet moment. And I think she was really touched by it, too. But she doesn't accept his apology at all. <laughs> She's not having it. She really I, does not want I think she wants the support, but she doesn't want it from him or doesn't want to allow herself to get emotionally caught up again with someone who's just going to turn around and hurt her. I mean, that's understandable. And so Jack ends up leaving her office and he he makes a little phone call and has a single white rose delivered to her with a note on it that says something like, if you won't accept my white flag, here's a white rose instead. She, she sees it on her desk and she picks it up and she promptly throws it in the trash. Oh, no, no, no. But then, after a little bit of thought, she fishes it out of the garbage can, puts it right up to her nose, and takes a big whiff, and a smile appears on her face. So, here we go. I mean, they're both totally intrigued with one another. Um, And I think they're both in denial about it, especially Jack. I mean, he is lonely, but, I mean, come on, Jack. Roses are for romance. You, You need to come into to realization with for what you're doing roses are for romance not for just a friend or for a lady who who your brother slept with you need to get it under control and realize that you're falling for her GC Buzz is running another article about Tyler and Abby being engaged. And I guess the implication is that maybe Mariah planted it so that it would cause some problems in their relationship. Maybe force them into, you know, thinking that they're further along than they are and destructing the whole thing. And it is. It is causing problems. The idea that it's out there, that they are at a point of ready to make the biggest commitment of their lives has definitely thrown them for a loop and now everybody's talking about it and all of a sudden Victor's approval 
is important to Abby. I don't know why. I don't know when that happened. Abby and Tyler have to have a sit down with Victor. And it was like an interview. Like Victor was interviewing Tyler to be his son-in-law. But then he reveals that he doesn't approve of him. Who even cares? Or he I don't know if it was that he didn't approve of Tyler. Or he doesn't approve of them getting married. Or Abby being married. Or I don't know. Who even cares? Do Victor's kids even need his approval at this point? I tell you, I didn't care about this at all, any of this, until the conversation turned to sparring, and uh, they decide, Victor and Tyler decide to have a boxing match. Damn, I gotta give Tyler credit for having cojones there. (laughs) I did laugh. I did laugh at the whole thing. I mean, Abby is not wanting that to happen the whole time she's trying to prevent it. Oh, guys, you guys, no, you don't need to box together. No, I don't want that to happen. Even after Victor left... (laughs) there's this moment where Abby's just touching Tyler's face and he's saying, what are you doing, babe? And she's like, I'm memorizing your face before my dad rearranges it. (laughs) Uh, Admittedly, I did. I did laugh at that. I enjoyed it. And oh, the other thing I did enjoy was uh, Abby getting catty with Kelly. I loved that Abby is seeing Kelly walking around the athletic club, knowing what she did to Billy's marriage, seeing that she's having some kind of new relationship with Jack and just marching right up to her office and saying what, you know, whatever it is you're up to, if you're just using Jack to get close to Billy, you're done now. And I appreciated that. I just, I liked seeing that. And even more so, I loved that Kelly didn't just take it. She just responded and said, look, listen up, Missy. You want to know who gets to be mad at me? Victoria. And that is a great point. That is the point that I think Jack made it a couple of times this week. What happened between Billy and Kelly hurt Victoria. She's the injured party, her and her son. So she's the one that's allowed to be angry, not everybody else in town. And Kelly just threw Abby right out of her office, and I loved it. I tell you, I would not have minded seeing those two ladies in the boxing gloves instead of Victor and Tyler. (laughs) That would have been good. Well, you know, the Victor and Tyler thing wasn't bad either. I mean, they go downstairs, they put on their, or go over to the the gym, they put on their boxing gloves, and it seems like Tyler just wants to jump right into it and fight. Stitch kind of steps in, and I don't know why he was there, but he was showing him, you know, different, how, how to do it. I mean, did anybody else notice that Victor seemed totally impressed with Stitch? <laughs> like, this is the son-in-law he wishes he had. I think Victor would just erase Billy out of Victoria's life and replace him with Stitch in a heartbeat. Well, he doesn't know whatever Stitch's deep, dark secret it is but did you guys get that too Uh, well um (laughs) the whole boxing match with victor and tyler was interesting and it really showed their two different personalities because here tyler wants to just hurry up and get he wants to fight he just wants to get right to the point and victor's trying to use this whole boxing thing as an analogy he wants to tell tyler something uh just um, subtly and tyler's not subtle so victor had to kind of pull out of the analogy and be overt about it and just say look the lesson here is if you hurt my daughter i'm gonna hurt you (laughs) i again laughed because after the sparring match was over Abby comes in and Tyler has a bandage on her face on his face and she immediately assumes that her dad punched him and (laughs) Tyler has to reveal oh no he slipped in the shower and hurt himself (laughs) he slipped in the shower (laughs) like the big slippery beefcake he is Dylan feels guilty over bringing Ian into Nikki's life, and he is certainly not going to let Willa come looking at Nikki for cash that he couldn't give her. So he is trying to protect Nikki from having to deal with the Ian Ward situation at at all possible. Meanwhile, Victor is giving Nikki another European vacation present that will never happen. (laughs) Oh, Gary left me a voicemail and pointed out, I do always say Victor's constantly giving Nikki vacations that they will never go on. (laughs) It's the recurring theme of their relationship. But 
you know, the the vacation aside, the bigger gift that Victor gives her is saying that he accepts Dylan as a part of their family, which was such a nice gesture. How nice of him to acknowledge that she has another son when she's done the same for him. We're just gonna have to see how long that lasts. It, it was very, it was very nice and hearts and flowers. And I just don't know how long it's gonna last. I do like that um, I mean, I don't know, Dylan is accepting it too. Gosh, again, I mean, I hate the tangent, but knowing that Stitch is starting to have this dark side, I just, I always thought he would end up being Nikki's son. And now that he's kind of feeling dark, I mean, Dylan is the guy that's the good guy. He's the hero. It would make sense that his father would be a really good guy. I could see Ian being Stitch's father. I do, I do, I like it. Because again, <laughs> Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, but I just, oh, part of me just thinks maybe Stitch could be Nikki's son. I don't want to let that go. <laughs> oh, but whatever. Dylan is accepting, you know, his, where he is now, that Nikki is his mother. He's starting to connect with her, asking questions about her past, and she's very willing to answer, even the uncomfortable ones about her, you know, for, being a former stripper. And, and so they talked this week and she shared some of his mother her motherly advice uh, she fixed his coffee machine with a big wad of bubble gum and I mean she's she's no dummy and she has something to offer to her son and I think also she's Nikki's coming to the realization that she made the right decision for him that it was hard for her to have to give this child away but knowing where she was in her life then and in the past and where she was getting ready to go it was probably better that he was raised by someone who was able to really take care of him so everybody's kind of coming to terms Nikki and Dylan and Victor and there was this really nice little scene this week where Nikki and Paul are sitting in the park. They're kind of connecting. I got a voicemail message from Connor this week who, you know, we have been talking about Nikki and Paul potentially becoming Dylan's or be, it being revealed that Nikki and Paul are Dylan's is are Dylan's parents and that it's going to form a connection between Nikki and Paul and possibly a romantic connection. And Connor was saying, I don't know if I want that because Nikki and Victor are the couple. And I do agree. I ultimately did not feel chemistry between Paul and Nikki the first time around. I mean, she was engaged to him not that long ago. I guess right, she was engaged to Jack right before this current marriage with Victor, and then Paul right before that. It never works out. Nikki loves Victor. She will always love Victor, no matter how hard she tries to get away from him, no matter what feelings she may have for another guy. It's always going to come back to Victor for her. So I don't think I believe in a long-term relationship with Nikki and Paul, but I did enjoy their little interaction. They're sitting there on the park bench this week, and he brings her an ice cream cone, and they're laughing about Paul trying to pick her up with an ice cream cone, like, as a come online, I guess, like 20 years ago. And they're just sitting there, remembering the past and chilling and eating their ice cream. <laughs> Was anyone else, like, completely transfixed by Nikki going at that ice cream cone. <laughs> Paul was letting his melt all over the place, but Nikki was on top of that. She was licking it down. <laughs> oh, I loved it. And I loved the flashback scene. Oh my gosh. I mean, it's probably the one of the, uh, the best flashback scenes. I'd never seen it, never heard of it. I love seeing a young Nikki and a young Paul with, oh, all his hair. <laughs> Oh, Paul, I guess, had dared Nikki to go skinny dipping at the local health club. And they're there, nude, in the showers when the basketball team comes in. And she's mortified. She's like, oh, my gosh, we got to sneak out of here. It was so cute. I loved it so much. <laughs> the flashback, the scene in the park, them having their dessert. It was lovely. Um, Hey, by the way... <laughs> Dylan and Avery are having dessert a lot, too. Um, <laughs> Dylan did submit Avery's recipe to the contest, and she got featured, as we talked about and totally predicted last week. Um, her salted caramel pie, or whatever it is, sounds amazing. <laughs> but then, I think probably to thank him... <laughs> Avery decides to give Dylan a sexy strip tease while Dylan records the whole thing on his new phone. <laughs> First of all, oh, Lord. Well, Avery was very hot. 
I loved, you know, she just was very sexy and very, like, we are constantly seeing as Avery as either the really staunch attorney, really, um, a, I guess, kind of, like, detail-oriented attorney, uh, left-brained, uh, or we're seeing her... Uh, as this Betty Crocker, and really, we're getting ready to see her as the sex kitten more. It was nice. Like, I liked her little strep tease. I think they do make a, a very cute couple, and she's trying to bring Dylan into the 21st century with a new phone, but, oh, Lord, don't ever let yourself be videoed. Yeah, she said no better than ever let yourself be videoed nude. There, nothing as good is going to come from that, ever. <laughs> and plus, Dylan came off kind of pervy. <laughs> He's recorded her doing this little strip tease, and I, there wasn't any, obviously, there wasn't any any of the good parts really showing but it was just he was going on about oh we could show this tape to our grandkids to show them how sexy their grandmother was um please don't <laughs> please don't show that to your grandkids or they may not be able to avoid it dylan goes to the coffee house later thinking that she's deleted the video off of his phone he's trying to fix his espresso machine he calls the repair guy and decides rather than sending him the serial number like reading it over the phone he's gonna try to just send him a photo of the serial number and the parts and all that stuff and instead he accidentally sends the video <laughs> Oh, Lord. Is this going to end up being a sexy, a sex scandal? Are Dylan and Avery going to have a sex tape out there? Or is this going to, was this just a small little, like, you know, one and done scene? Or is this going to turn into a bigger storyline? I don't know, but I love it. <laughs> hmm. Dylan's perviness and Avery's pure embarrassment is my pure entertainment. Nick shows up at the hospital and he squeezes it out of the doctor that Sharon has had shock treatment and the doctor reveals, oh, there could be some side effects, you think? I mean, yeah, there's going to be some side effects. Sharon is in her room, um, I guess dreaming of her previous meeting with Faux Cassie or maybe hallucinating it or maybe it's a little bit more of both. I think it was a dream. She's dreaming uh, about uh, seeing Cassie again and Cassie, It's it, but it's a meld. It's like a meld of her version of her perfect daughter and this new kind of angry Cassie. It's all jumbled together in Sharon's head. The This Cassie is telling her to remember the secret. There's something that you need to remember. Um, and I think what I believe it was, was it was an odd sequence, but I believe it was a dream that Sharon was having. It was like a dream manifestation of her memory slipping away. Sharon has just had this shock treatment, and uh, there are side effects, which include amnesia and, uh, I don't know, maybe some confusion. And I think that dream was Sharon's last, maybe, memory of what she had done, the secret that she's keeping. Because, um... Sharon had kind of woke up, she had woken up later, and you could tell that she was fighting to hold on to these last little bits, like they were shrapnel uh, scattered all about her brain, and she was struggling to hold on to something, and uh, Nick is there by her bedside, he had just kind of talked to her and, and, and confessed to her his feelings and how much he cares for her and loves her and she's saying you know he she wakes up just for a bit and he's telling her you know that seeing Cassie was not real she you know, she thinks she's seen Cassie yet again and he says you know it's it, that's not real and Sharon slips back into sleep and then awake again and we get this new Sharon it's like Wow, the whole electroshock therapy thing just totally worked. It totally made the fact that she was seeing Cassie slip from her memory. As soon as she wakes up, Nick is saying, like, uh, you know, are you still seeing Cassie? Or I can't remember how it was brought up, but she said something like, um, you know, Ca what What do you mean? Our, you know, our daughter is dead, Nick. I mean, why, you know, what, what's that mean? It's just, she really seems confused. Like, she almost can't remember them being together, but, like, it's, it's odd. Her, everything is just jumbled together in her mind, but I think we're getting this new version of Sherry, of Sharon. Um, Cassie's, by the way, on a plane, <laughs> getting ready to get out of jo Dodge. 
She calls to check on Sharon, but has this last minute change of heart and gets out uh, of the plane. I think she, I don't know if she's going to come back and continue to help Sharon remember. But just as Sharon is talking with Nick, uh, he mentions that dream about Cassie, and she and she says, "You know, our daughter's not alive. She's she's gone. She's dead, Nick." So I mean, that whole electroshock therapy thing totally worked wonders. I I don't know if this is the beginning of a new storyline where we just forget about it. I mean, we just forget that Sharon ever switched those paternity results. I mean, frankly, I would love to get electroshock therapy to take away some of my uncomfortable memories, including the fact that Sharon switched those paternity results. Courtney is at the park with Noah, and he's confided to her everything that's gone on with Sharon, and they're having another connecting moment, getting their relationship back on track, and a dealer comes by to meet her. She's undercover still, and this guy comes by to, I guess, try to give her drugs, or she's requested some drugs. She tries to get him to reveal his source, like whoever the main, they're still trying to get at whoever the main drug dealer in town is, but the guy catches on to what she's doing right away. And just tells her to be careful. Like, you don't need to be asking too many questions or someone might get hurt. And he kind of looks over at Noah, too. So there's this awkward um, implication here that someone's going to get hurt. It may be Courtney. It may be Noah. It may be Courtney needing to save Noah. But Courtney goes back to the police station, goes to Paul, and tells him that she wants to go back to the street beat. (laughs) <laughs> just being a like go out of the undercover thing and just become a regular on the street cop, I guess. And Paul gives her his blessing, but he also gives her a warning and says, you know, when you go out of cover, all of those drug dealers, all the drug dealers, everybody you've been trying to catch are now going to know exactly who you are and that you are a cop and that you were lying to them. And that could put you in danger. I mean, Paul straight up tells her that could put her in danger. So... Is it me or is that kind of dumb? Like, why would you do that? Why would you choose to now blow your cover and then just go out onto the streets of Genoa City? You're just asking for trouble. Okay, you guys, it's time for me to get going. I need to go take my car for a test spin. (laughs) Go for a joy ride. I hope I did okay recapping the show. Again, I'm sorry. I literally am like sleep deprived. So it may be a little bit crazy, but um, I hope I did okay. And I hope I hit all of the main points and I hope you enjoyed it. So everybody have a good week. I love. 